If you are just joining, we will begin our webinar around 10 a.m. Uh, Pacific. Uh, so we have a couple minutes, uh, and at that point, uh, we'll begin the webinar. Hello, everyone. We will begin our webinar at 10 a.m. Pacific, 11 a.m. Mountain. Thank you for joining us today. We will begin shortly. Hello, everyone. Uh, we will begin shortly. If you're just joining, uh, the webinar will begin at 11, sorry, at 10 a.m. Pacific, 11 a.m. Uh, Mountain Time. Thank you for joining us early. We will begin shortly. If you are just joining us, we will begin uh, shortly. Thanks for being on time. Good morning to everyone and welcome to the Revolutionary Accounting Series with Tom Wilwright and Jody Padar. Today's topic is Secrets to Successful Services, Pricing and Firm Staffing. This is our agenda for today. Uh, our webinar will begin uh, now. <laughs> uh, we'll have a 45 minute topic discussion, then we'll have a 45 minute Q&A with everyone joining us here on our Zoom. Um, so if you're watching on the live stream, please feel free to join us on Zoom so that you can ask questions. And our webinar will end at 11.30 a.m. Pacific. Uh, let's get familiar with our control panel. Everyone's currently on mute. You can ask your question by using the raise your hand or QA feature. Click here to, rest, uh, to raise your hand when you're ready to ask a question. And at that point, you will be taken off mute to ask your question. Click here uh, for the Q&A feature to type your question at any time. If you're using the raise your hand feature, your control panel microphone feature will change once you're selected. A microphone will appear in your control panel. Click on the microphone to unmute yourself, and then you can ask your question. If you're using the Q&A feature, do not use the chat feature to ask your question. Click on the Q&A feature and a pop-up will appear. And at that point, you can enter your question and hit send. 
Uh, our agenda for today, for those of you just joining, we will begin our webinar shortly. We will have a 45 minute topic discussion with a 45 minute Q&A session. Uh, just a reminder, anyone that is watching us outside of the webinar in Zoom, if you wanna ask your question, you are welcome to join us on the Zoom side. Uh, the housekeeping items for today, if you're using the telephone, um, please make sure that uh, when you ask your question, like I said on the control panel, you're able to unmute your microphone. If you're ready to ask your question, use a raise your hand feature, or you can type your question into the question box at any time. Uh, Tom, Jody, we are ready for you guys. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you, Manny. Um, we can, I think, take the those down. Thank you. Welcome, everyone. Welcome, Jody. It is, uh, this is a uh, a first of uh, multiple webinars that Jody and I are going to do together. It's really a privilege and honor um, to be with Jody Padar, who's um, well known throughout the accounting profession and uh, really very practical and, and uh, lots of good um, practical advice. Um, and we're going to have a, a lot of fun this morning. Jody, welcome. Are you there, Jody? Can you hear me? Thank you. I'm so excited to be here today. It's going to be fun. I can. Um, can you hear me now or no? I can hear you now. Yes, that's awesome. All okay. Right. Perfect. So um, Jody and I got together. We decided... Awesome. Well, anyways, it's fun to be here. I'm excited. Awesome. Well, so I'm going to let Jody introduce herself in just a second. Um, I, uh, Jody and I, between us, have a lot of years experience. I have a lot more years than Jody. Um, <laughs> she's she's uh, moved through the profession much faster than I have. Um, but I, uh, I spent a lot of years, uh, I spent several years with Ernst & Young, including uh, three in their national tax office. I spent uh, several years as an in-house tax advisor for a Fortune 1000 company, 14 years as an adjunct professor in the Master of tax, Master's of Tax Program at Arizona State University. Um, uh, built from scratch a, a large CPA firm and uh, then bought CPA firms along the way. Uh, I've uh, recently, over the last 20 years, I've spent a lot of time with Mr. Robert Kiyosaki of Rich Dad Poor Dad fame, traveling around the world, speaking on financial education, and he's the one who encouraged me to write my book, Tax Free Wealth, which has uh, uh, been a perennial bestseller, and uh, just recently, about a year ago, wrote um, and six months ago, released the Win-Win Wealth Strategy, which fortunately is also a bestseller. So it's, it's very nice that we have an audience to talk to. We're very, um, at our company, WealthAbility, we have a network of CPA firms. And uh, we're going to talk about that, but we're going to really focus on really what are the biggest issues in January of 2023? What are the biggest issues facing the accounting profession? Um, two of those big, big issues are uh, pricing, um, these are what uh, Jody and I hear all the time, pricing, and the other one is staffing, and uh, how do they work together. So, Jody, would you give us just a little bit of your background? Sure. So, I'm Jody Paydar, the Radical CPA, and um, I'm a little bit radical, except um, I'm always about spreading the word and helping other people get radical too. So um, I left a mid-sized firm almost 20 years ago and said there had to be a better way and really thought through using new technology and pricing and uh, working with customers differently to think through what uh, a lot of people call the new firm today, except I was doing it, you know, 15 years ago, really um, paving the way, being the innovator on it and figuring it out. I own that firm, recently exited it, and I'm now in the startup world, and I currently It's really important too, because as we look at where um, tax software is going and where things are headed, what we have to do as tax professionals to um, maintain our relevance and stay in the game and utilize new technology to um, serve our clients better. So I'm really excited to be here today to talk about staffing and also um, pricing because it makes a really big difference in um, how you run your firm. Awesome, thank you, Jody. So let's go ahead and and, uh, um, and if you would, if you put into uh, the chat, just put in where you're from. Where are you? Where are you calling in from? Where are you? If you're on Zoom, go ahead and put in where you're from. Let us see. Um, 
uh, you know, what you're, you know, wh where are you in the world today? I'm fortunate. I'm in uh, Phoenix, Arizona, where it's nice and beautiful and it's starting to get warm. And Jody, where are you today? So I am in northeastern Wisconsin, about an hour northeast of Green Bay, and it is 25 degrees and snowing where I am. Nice. So um, awesome. And by, by the way, just so you know, we are going to take, oh, here we go. You're, we're getting them in um, the Q&A. Go ahead and feel free to put them in the chat, uh, in, the, in the chat, uh, as opposed to the Q&A for these, for where you are. Uh, it says chat's disabled, um, Manny. So this is saying that chat's disabled. Uh, there you go. So go ahead and put it in Q&A until we get the chat up. Thank you. All right, so I want to start with uh, one of one of the topics that kind of brought Jody and myself together. Uh, we're part of a group called AIR, um, Accounting Influencers Roundtable, and one of the things that brought us together was our similar views on pricing versus billing. Certainly, one of the I remember uh, years ago, Jody, when I left Big Four and I went into um, the Fortune 1000 company. What I found was that um, one of the best things about it is that I didn't have to track time anymore. And I didn't have, bill, have to bill my time. I didn't have to track my time. I was there. I was getting the work done. That's what was important. Um, and it was a big relief, frankly, um, to be able to not have to feel that pressure of uh, billing. So, you know, when we talk, about, and then, and then fast forward, and I start my CPA form, and I'm sending out bills, and I mean, how many of you have have gotten um, negative responses from a bill, right? You send a bill out and people, you know, have questions about, well, what about this bill? What about this? What about this? And you've already done the work. Okay, so here's this serious issue that you've already done the work. You're expecting to be paid for it. You did send them an engagement letter and they said they would pay for it. But now the work's done and they're going, yeah. I don't think it was worth that. I don't. I don't think uh, you know. I should pay you that much. And uh, you know, there's and 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 we have our insurance companies, Cameco, that are saying, well, you can't really go after the clients for that bill um, because if you do, you're you know, then you're just opening up a can of worms. So, Jody, um, give us some of your thoughts on billing practices. So. I think we have to set the stage. Um, insurers confuse the terms. And so pricing is when you do the, when you price the work up front before you begin work. And billing is when you bill work terms, because I think a lot of accountants use them interchangeably, right? So you bill after the fact, you price up front. So that's the first thing. But the second thing is, is I think that there's no reason we should be sending bills anymore because everything should be done up front. We should know what it takes to get the job done. And we should think about how we start pricing our services. So A, we get paid on time, but B, everybody's in alignment on what work should be done, how it should be done. And both the client has a better experience and we as accountants have a better experience. Yeah, so we're gonna get into how to price. Um, but, but right now, look, um... One of the things that I've noticed is certain industries have learned this lesson. And I'm going to start with the automotive industry because I love cars. And I remember the days, um, not too many years ago, maybe 20 years ago, where you took your car in to get repaired and uh, you're thinking, oh, you know, it needs an oil change. And the next thing you know, you've got a $500, $600 bill because, oh, well, we found this wrong, this wrong, wrong, this wrong, and we fixed them, and here's the bill. And you're going, wait a minute, I don't have five, $600, right, to pay for this, and yet you're giving me this bill. Well, yeah, but we did the work. And uh, we all know how that felt when people handled, handed us that unexpected bill. And dentists. There's a, another one is dentists. Dentists uh, did the same thing. You know, they, they go drill your teeth. They, they um, you know, do uh, procedures on your mouth. And then they give you this bill and you go, wait a minute. This is way more than I was expecting. Well, fast forward. And now we have two professions that they tell you right up front. So you don't, they don't start working on your car until you get that text or that email that says, um, 
hey, here's here's what we found. Uh, I know from my BMW dealer, I actually get a video that shows what they've inspected and what they found and actually shows why. And, and then they they give me, okay, well, here are the options and here's what we think and here's what the price is. Here's what the price is in order to do this. They don't tell me how much the price is per, they don't tell me what they're gonna bill me by hour. They don't tell me what the parts are gonna cost. They don't tell me any of the inputs. They simply say, here's what's wrong. Here's what needs to be fixed. Here's the outcome and here's the price for it. Dentists, much the same thing. If they're gonna, if, if they're gonna do a root canal, um, which is not a pleasant thing in the first place, it, you know, a, you, a root canal used to be, you felt like you got a root canal twice right? The first time you got the root canal was when they did it. The second one was when they gave you the price and they were both equally painful. And now they give you the price of the root canal up front. They say, here's what it's going to cost. Do you want us to do this? And so um, to me, Jody, it's all about giving the clients a choice. Uh, when we bill, we're not really giving them a choice. We're, the only choice they have is do they use us or not. They're not getting a choice as to what services we perform or how they pay for those services. Whereas we give them a price, then we're actually saying, well, here's your choice. This is the service. This is the price. Do you still want to do this? What are your thoughts on that, Jody? Well, I think it's really important to think about it and to think about it from a strategic standpoint and how it's going to affect your firm um, bigger picture wise, right? So again, it, it has such an overreaching effect on your firm completely. You get to think about how much money you're actually going to make, right? And how you're going to price for things and how you're going to deliver them. It helps you think about how you're going to build capacity within your firm. It also helps you think about, um, managing your employees better, right? Like, because if to perform um, for these particular clients, then you can actually teach your team how to do that particular work and how they can serve your clients better. And then it makes just your whole firm and culture just that much better because everybody's now aligned, which makes a big difference for your customer, which I think ultimately is what we mean with. Um, what they're getting and understand it better. And if we're all aligned at the beginning, it's a lot easier to deliver that level of expectation and that right customer service for them. About right, because we always talk about pricing like it's independent from a firm, but it really is a holistic approach to the way you manage your firm. Yeah, I, I think that's a really good point. And, and really what we're talking about is, you know, who gets to make decisions here? Is it us or the client? And what we'd like to do is we'd like to set the discussion. We'd like to set the expectations. And then the client gets to make the choice. So remember, somebody's always setting expectations. And uh, the clients are setting expectations in their mind. They're, what, what services am I getting? How much am I paying for? And what's the value of those services? What we're doing is we're taking that, um, the opportunity to really give them, here's being very specific. So we're just sending out our engagement letters right now in my CPA firm. So besides running, running WealthAbility as a network of CPA firms, I do have a small CPA firm. We have about 12 professionals and we're sending out engagement letters right now. So we're doing this. Um, and in the engagement letters, we're very specific about what services we render. Now, you can price in a lot of different ways, right? We price on a flat fee. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to do all of this. We've looked at your situation. We've come up with what we think the price should be. And here's what it's going to be. And we bill on and, and we actually collect that on a monthly basis. That doesn't mean you have to price that way. You can price here's tax returns. And the reality is we know what that price is, right, Jody? I mean, we know what the price is of tax return because we rarely change the fee from year to year. So why not just tell it to them up front? What's your price is? What your price is. Absolutely, you know what your price is. 
So I think I'm having a little bit of internet difficulty. I'm going to jump out and I will be right back. Okay. So I'm going to, I'm going to keep going here. So. Yes. Um, thanks, Jody. Um, sorry about that, everyone. Uh, technology is sometimes challenging, uh, I, particularly maybe in northern Wisconsin, but um, it is everywhere. Let me tell you, we've had, I can't, how many of you have been in your, your you're in the middle of tax returns and your in, internet goes out and you're logged into your firm's computer and your firm computer system and you, you're like, I'm, I'm done. I mean, there are times when I've had to just race to the office to do a podcast or an interview or something like that. Um, so we're going to let Jody uh, figure out her internet connection. In the meantime, I want to keep talking about pricing because uh, the reality is that pricing is uh, pricing is something that's not that hard. We're really we know what that tax return costs. We're going to bill about the same thing from year to year to year, or we know what we're gonna increase it for. So all we're doing in pricing is just telling the client up front what the price is. And we're committing to that price, okay? So one of the differences between pricing and billing is we're committing. But the second thing is, is how many of you have ever felt like you were a bank? How many ever felt like you were the bank for your clients? that you actually felt like, and, and if you, you know, if you want to just go ahead and type in to, into the, in the, in the chat, just type in um, no bank. And, you know, I don't want to be the bank. Here's, here's how actually I came about this. There you go. No bank, Mar Maria, no bank, Lloyd, no, Mar no bank, John, I'm not a bank, no bank. This is awesome. Um, put those in because I hated being the bank. Here's what happened. So number of years ago, my, uh, partner at the time, uh, who's actually still my partner in WealthAbility, um, Anne and I, um, January comes along. And of course, we have a line of credit because we were the bank for our clients. So we have a line of credit and we get a notice from the bank. We, we are pulling your line of credit. You, um, you violated one of your, uh, your one, one of the aspects of our contract. We're just pulling, they didn't give us a notice. They didn't say you can fix it. They just pulled it. We're going, oh my heavens, what are we going to do? So we took the first step. The first step we did was we said, well, what we're going to do is we're going to send out um, retainers. So <laughs> we're going to actually get the clients to pay us a little bit up front. They don't have to pay us everything up front. We're going to let us pay them, pay us a little bit up front. And that way the clients paying, you know, they're doing their own banking. If they need to borrow that money to pay us up front, they need to. But what we realized was is that most professions and most um, companies do bill up front. If you're building a house, um, you don't you don't get to pay for that at the end. You have to finance that up front. You're paying the contractors part of that fee up front. If you're uh, you don't uh, you know you don't walk in to um, the Apple store and walk out with an iPhone and they, and they say, well, we'll send you a bill. That doesn't happen. So you walk out and you pay for it. So uh, this whole idea of being billing at the end of doing the work and collecting at the end, to me just makes no sense. And we were forced into it because our bank, we made a mistake, forced us into it. But what a blessing um, because what it did was it turned January from our worst month collection wise to our best month collection wise because we collected all the retainers and we had that money to pay for our um, our our uh, our staffing over the next few months until we actually got the tax returns done. I didn't think that was good enough, Jody. I thought, you know what? We're still waiting until the end. Now, granted, you should never ever let a tax return walk out the door or financial statement walk out the door without payment. Is, you agree, Jody? I agree, but that's not industry practice. <laughs> well, that's shocking. I mean, that's shocking. It's not industry practice, but it should be. I'll, I'll I mean, what. come on. Let's be real. I mean, I 100% I, I agree, but I bet 50% of practitioners let it happen every day. That is... Um, that's 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 disconcerting. So let's start there, can we? Let's start with 
okay, let's not <laughs> let let's not let work out walk out the door without getting paid. Now let me let me continue the story a little bit here. So one of our challenges was we'd have clients um, <laughs> we'd have clients that um, I I like that give pricing up front, but won't won't file the return until the invoice is paid. Well, that's what we were doing. So we we're going okay. We're 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 going to tell you. So for years we did this. So we'd send out a retainer agreement up front. By the way, everybody at, at a minimum sent out a retainer agreement. Nobody's going to complain. And those who complain, you don't want for clients. I'm I'm dead serious about that. They they want to wait until the end. Then they are taking advantage of you, and you're letting them take advantage of you. Do not do that. All right. Start this year. Say if you haven't sent your engagement letters out yet. And you're working on them right this minute. And you're going, we're going to get these out at the end of the week, or we're going to get them out first of next week. First thing you do is put in a retainer. We put in a retainer of about 50% of the cost of the of the cost of the tax return. Second thing, what we did is we estimated. We said, well, we don't know what it's really going to cost. So this was isn't still isn't pricing. We're still doing billing here. Okay. Right. This was baby steps. And we're going to estimate the cost. And here's kind of the estimate, and we'll get you a, but what we did was we said, before we start on the return, we will get you a final price, okay? So we will tell you how much it's going to be. We still weren't collecting. We, it wasn't a flat fee. It wasn't any of that, but it was, okay, we are going to get you a price. Well, what that meant was, though, we still had to do a couple of things that, um, uh, fast forward to last year, we're not doing anymore. And one is, we still had to, on every single individual tax return, uh, every single tax returns, every single year, once we got the information in, we had to get an email out saying, here's the price. Okay. We didn't do that wholesale. It wasn't, it wasn't clear in the engagement letter. The engagement letter just was an estimate and we got their approval. Well, I think that was a very good first step. Frankly, we got their approval ahead of time. So from that standpoint, it was pricing. Okay. So right. we did get their approval ahead of, ahead of time saying, yes, we agree to this. Um, we still tracked our hours. We still build our hours. And at, at the end of the year, it, at the end of the tax return, if it turned out to be more, we had to explain why it was more. So Jody, your, um, your internet's still, still a little shaky here. So I'm going to keep, I'm going to keep. Um, it's still not very good. It, it's still not. You might want to turn off your video okay. if, if that uh, helps a little bit. Um, sometimes I find that the video feed takes the, the most amount of um, effort there. Can, uh, Jody, you want to uh, say something about this? Let's see how your voice comes through. Okay, so we will get Jody back. So we're going to do, uh, just so you all know, we, we're going to do a full day on this um, at the end of the month. Jody's going to be involved. We're going to get her really strong internet. And uh, for then, in the meantime, I'm going to talk about um, what Jody and I have already talked about when it comes to pricing. So um, at a minimum, we want to give our clients an option and at least tell them up front, here's what the price is. They're, they're not going to complain. Typically, if it's similar to last year, they're not going to complain about the price. But now we have it in writing. And that's a bare minimum. On top of that, we want to make sure that I think we want to make sure we get some money up front because I don't want to depend on, okay, let's say they go, I, I, I'll give you an example. So my, my wife is a CPA. She has a small CPA firm and she had a client for a while that he wanted the tax return prepared in February, but he didn't want it released until October. Well, he wouldn't pay until it was released. So <laughs> she she's literally holding he's like doesn't have to pay her she's done all the work and she's not billing him and he's not paying until he actually gets the tax return i mean she doesn't let him go out the door without getting paid but i was um but that's a problem second of all let's say that you have a, a client that does get your their information to you late and they're not, you're not ready to file that tax return until October 14th or October 15th, um, heaven forbid. They have to pay you to get that tax return released. 
I had a couple of clients that were really upset that that was, and he said, well, you don't trust me. When mm, not the issue. The issue is you're walking out with a product and you need to pay me for that product. And we had that discussion and we had the discussion just a couple of years ago. And um, so I didn't, I don't think that's the ultimate answer, but I do think that at least giving them a price up front um, is, is a partial answer. Jody. But I also think don't most of your clients respond positively to even getting it right. Didn't half of them send a, the checks up front. Like I think a lot of times oh, they, they people think, right. People think their clients aren't going to be responsive and yet their clients send in the checks because there's their clients want to pay. Uh, they, it, it's something, it's a personal belief that I think we have about it, that we have an expectation that our, and they think, we think that our clients have that expectation. But I know when we first started sending those invoices up front, nobody even like they send checks back and we were surprised. Right. And it was like, but they wanted to pay. They, they knew we were going to deliver the product for them. And so they, ha they were happy to pay, or they sent us like credit card numbers or routing numbers or whatever, so that we could debit them directly. And again, I think a lot of it is our own self-limiting beliefs on what um, we as practitioners, because we've always done it this way, think our clients are going to do. But in reality, our clients, most of them will adapt to the changes as long as you give them that opportunity. Yeah, I will tell you the first year we sent out retainer, um, we, we, retainer agreements, um, we, uh, <laughs> we were scared to death. Honestly, scared to death. Or are the clients going to complain? What's the issue? We had, out of all of our clients, and we were a decent sized firm by then, we were probably a, a three or $4 million firm by then. We had two clients that even raised the issue. Okay. And of course, I went back to them and said, So tell me what the issue is. Well, you don't trust me. I said, No, I don't want to be your bank. And what I found is, I found is all we're doing is being transparent with our clients is that. Why, why, am I, why am I paying for your tax return to be prepared? Why aren't you paying for your tax return to be prepared? This makes no sense to me. So I think that, you know, to me, that actually increases the, the um, communication with the client because the client's saying, well, here's my issues. Well, okay, well, let's talk about that. All right. And don't apologize. I mean, seriously, we're the only profession out, even the legal profession gets a retainer, right? We're the only profession in the world that I know of that doesn't get paid up front. So why are we afraid of that? Like you say, Jody, I think we do have these self-limiting beliefs that are causing us, where, do we value our services? That's part of the question. Right. And the other thing is, is the, the thing that I think you forget about too, is when you price up front, you do all that work ahead of time. And then like, you just get to collect the checks, right? You're not like worried about people who are tracking time and billing time and whatever, like there's free money there because your team isn't spending all that time doing that chasing of the invoices and collecting and all that stuff, exactly. which we forget about because it's like, oh, they're sitting, not that they're sitting there, but they're doing work anyway. So this is just one of their additional responsibilities. You forget how much time they get back because they're not chasing down all these payments. Right. Think, think about how much more. So this is where this is where this whole conversation goes to staffing, right? Because we, you know, the the question I'm sure some of you are asking is, why are we talking about pricing and staffing in the same conversation? And we, you know, we talked about this and I think they are so closely related. For example, if you priced up front, what have you also done? You also projected how many hours it's going to take. Well, if you've projected how many hours it's going to take, you can project how many staff you need. You can project how many hours they're going to work. And you can't do that if you're just behind the curve and behind the eight ball and you're just going, well, wait a minute. I'm trying to, you know, I'm just going to bill it when I, when I get it, you don't know. Okay. So I love this. So, so here, here we've got a, a, a comment in the, in the chat. They've got a, a Philip saying they've got a great client who told him that he was too nice and should bill more. Okay. And I love that. Uh, I, I'll, I'll share, I'll, I'll share a similar uh, comment. I have a client that is a very big client of ours and, um, I, we do a, an upfront fee 
um, with our clients. So we do something a little different than most people do anyway. We do an upfront service. And he said, well, how much is it? And at the time I said, well, it's $75,000 for that upfront project. And he told me later, he said, Tom, had it been less than that, I would not have come because that's telling me what you believe the value is of those services. So pricing is also, you know, we talk about pricing as yeah, billing versus billing, but there's also a matter of how much are you pricing? We have actually found Jody in our network because we, we talk about this all the time in the Wealth Ability Network. Um, and what we found is, is that people who once, once they join our network and they see that other people are doing this, They'll, they'll double or triple some of their hourly rates. They'll double or triple some of their prices. And we actually had the very first year we had a network. We only had five people in the network the very first year. One of the, the, one of the people, um, uh, one of the members came to me and they said, so we were a little worried about this. They have a huge number of tax returns, do like 4,000 tax returns. We lost, she, and here's what she told me. We lost 20% of our clients and doubled our bottom line. That's amazing. So how many of you would like to lose 20% of your clients and double your bottom line? I mean, I think both of those are good things, but together they're great things. So, so Jody, talk about, can we talk a little bit more about the effect on staffing when it comes to this whole pricing idea? Yeah, so I think it comes um, down to, too, like expectations about if you know what you've priced for and your client knows what you price for, now you know what you're going to deliver, right? So now you can figure out how many hours it's going to take or what it's going to take, because it may not even be hours. It may be a matter of minutes, depending on the technology you're using and other things, but and the value you're providing, because I don't necessarily equate time with value. But what it does is now it allows you to build this capacity plan. And now you can say, you know, my my team is going to work 50 out, no more than 50 hours a week from February 1st through April 15th, whatever that means for your firm. My firm during tax season, I always like 50 hours a week because I think there's a there's still season to tax season. I don't care. Like, but I, my team never worked more than that. Right. So now you can actually set those, I'll say, time budgets and you can have your team um, allocate that time to them. And then they know what they're supposed to do and what they're going to deliver on. And then what they're going to start to do is you're going to start to actually make more money because they're going to work less on these accounts because tr traditionally they would do something um, called uh, scope creep where they would actually like do more work than was actually necessary that you either wrote off or wrote down or didn't do because the client really didn't want it. And your team didn't really understand that they weren't getting paid for it. So because they know exactly what they're supposed to do, they'll step back. They'll ask you a question if something goes beyond scope and say, hey. We were doing I something. catch an ability to actually even bill more for certain things because you know that it went outside of scope. Right. And so. Now you actually, and your team feels like they've been heard and they're not working a bazillion hours a week and they know what they're working on. Because if you want team to stay, you have to set clear expectations and you have to give them clear, like the worst thing about being in a, at a firm is not knowing what you're supposed to do. And think about if you're in a firm with multi-partners and you have five different partners who want things done five different ways, like team hates that, right? And so the more standardized you can get around pricing and deliverables, then your team can actually feel like they're doing a good job. They know what the expectation is and they know how to deliver outstanding service to, to your clients because they know what they're doing. Because that's, I think as a team member, the hardest thing is you don't know what you're doing when your firm allows everything to happen and there's no standardization or process around it. Right. I mean, that, that's a good point. Is I, I think we you can even back up a little bit as to what are you providing? What is the service you're providing? Um, you know, we can get into, we, we can do a whole, we'll do a whole <laughs> separate one on branding. Okay. Because that's what that's about. But you do have to be, I, again, we're setting expectations here. We're setting expectations with our staff. We're setting expectations with the client. 
here's the services we provide, here's the cost of I, those services. I mean, think about a simple corporate tax return, right? A simple corporate tax return. You get in a QuickBooks file, does that include cleanup or not to get to the tax return? And who pays for that cleanup, right? right? And, and so, there are many practitioners who spend all the time cleaning it up and say that's part of their tax return. There are other people who say, no, cleanup is separate and the tax return is separate. I'm not saying how you should run your business. I'm saying you need to think about what's important to you and how you're going to charge for these things, right? And I think it's important that if you separate things like completely, then you can actually think about the price and the value and how you want to charge for that deliverable. So there may be some people who say, I do it all in and it's $5,000. There may be other people who say, well, the tax return is $2,000 and the QuickBooks accounting is separate and I'm going to do that in, in a different way business model, whether monthly or something else. But I think when you, especially when you talk about tax, we always forget that unless you have solid data, you can't do a good tax return anyways. So how does that data come in the door and how are you accounting for that data and how are you pricing for that data? And if you don't think about it and kind of break it up like that, then again, your team doesn't know what to do. You run out of capacity because now you got to clean up on a file that you didn't know you had to clean up, et cetera. And so that's where like kind of it all comes together. Yeah. And, and you talked a little bit about value here and, and you, you were mentioning about what do you value, but really the important thing is what are your clients value? 100%. Right? One of the things that I, that I keep thinking about is as accountants, so many times we sell something the client doesn't value and we give away something the client does value. Okay, the clients don't value tax returns. They do value the sleep at night aspect of tax returns. They don't wanna be audited. They do not value the tax return itself. If you, if you asked your clients, if you asked 100 clients, if you had a choice of finding a tax return or not, would you? Uh, I would guarantee you 100 clients would say, no, I don't wanna do that. So it's not valuable to them. It's not a, it's not really a valuable service. Now, you know, it, preparing the financial statements, yeah, that could be a valuable service, but the tax return really, and yet we're spending so much of our effort billing, collecting, pricing our tax returns. What about all the consulting we do? How many people, Jody, how, what percentage of the accounting profession do you think bills for tax returns and gives away consulting? probably 90%. <laughs> because I think, I, I, I think too, when you talk about this advisory services, we've all been doing advisory for years. We just never called it that. We called it a tax return, right? Right. <laughs> exactly. So if you think about it, go, what, what do the clients value? Well, they value lower taxes, okay? Sometimes in preparing the tax return, are you coming up with ideas to lower their taxes? Absolutely, okay? They value sleep at night. So they value, okay, am I comfortable that the IRS isn't going to, you know, there aren't a lot of red flags on my tax return. Do they value that? Yeah, but guess what? That is also consulting because now they value what you're doing over and above just the raw data input. They don't value the data input. I've never had a client tell me, wow, what I really love about you, Tom, is your ability to input data. Nobody has ever commented on that. Every one of them says, Tom, what I love about what you guys do is that you reduce our taxes. I'm comfortable that when there's an audit, you're going to take care of me. You're going to be able to handle that IRS audit. And that most of the time, you, I'm never going to see an audit. That's what I value. And then, and that a lot of that is part of tax training. Jody, a few years ago, a number of years ago, we sat our staff down. We said, write down, we gave them 10 minutes write down all the things we do to, and this is an exercise y'all can do, write down all the things we do on a tax return to either reduce taxes or reduce the chance of an audit. And I think in 10 minutes, I think our staff came up with something like 65 different ways we did that. And I'm going, okay, that's what, that's the value. That's what we should be billing for. Right. Right. But do we express it enough when we talk to our clients? And I think, again, that comes back to how, how are we positioning what it is we're doing so that our clients understand that value? Because otherwise, if we don't express it and we don't tell them, 
how are they supposed to be mind readers to know that this is what, what we do differently, especially when you look at most, um, most clients think if, if you're a tax practitioner, you've been in business so many years or whatever, you're the same as everyone else, right? Well, again, if you're not differentiating yourself as to how you express value different, what makes you different than the guy next door? And I think that's where, again, we do ourselves a disservice and that we were never really taught how to express that value. Yet a lot of times when a new prospect comes in, how many times do we give away that value without even getting anything signed, right? Like all of a sudden you look at their tax return and you start finding all these strategies or all these things, and yet they're not even a client and we're already expressing to them how we can save them money. Like, right, right. We, we, we call that spilling the candy in the lobby, Jody, oh. <laughs> where we're giving them all the candy in the lobby and they're going, well, I can get this for free. I literally had somebody say, well, because we were charging them $500 for an initial consultation. They said, well, I can go someplace else and get that for free. And I said, well, you should go there. That's where yeah. you should go. You should not be here because we value what we do and our clients value what we do. And if you don't value what we do, we really don't want you for a client. Let's talk about just briefly here and we'll start opening up for questions. Um, and if you've got questions, please uh, put them in the Q&A, start putting them in the Q&A. Um, how does this affect staff? Because, you know, um, staff work really hard. Uh, believe it or not, they don't but work hard for the partners. Um, they, for the most part, I don't think they really care about the partners. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm just telling it the way I see it. Okay, I never did. I didn't care about the partners when I was, you know, in big four. And uh, so what do they care about? Well, but they do care about the clients. And so if the clients are happy, then and the clients are feeling uh, are valuing what the staff does. How does the staff react to that? because they're not working 65 hour weeks, right? And then trying to live their lives. So again, it, it, it really impacts your culture because now your team has time to think. They have time to, to consider more complex tax scenarios and, they're, and they can respond to clients faster, right? Again, how many, um, if you look at some of these surveys, like the, like, I think the number one problem, like, taxpayers say is their accountants are not responsive, right? Well, if you've got all this work, it's very hard to be responsive. But if you've limited that work because you've priced correctly, now all of a sudden your clients can get a hold of a team member when they need to and ask a question. And that that response may be in whatever your response time is or whatever you set that as, but it will certainly be a lot quicker than the person who has way too many tax returns on their plate and they can't even take a breath to respond to a client call or to a client email. Exactly. So, um, so as, as I mentioned earlier, we're going to spend a whole day on this topic on January 30th and uh, we'll, we'll get you the link to how to sign up for that um, on January 30th. But just so you know, this, this is a, 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 very, a, a very big topic when we talk about pricing, billing, staffing. For example, um, I'll just throw out some thoughts. I'm not gonna be, we're not going to be able to answer all this uh, over the next uh, half an hour or so. But do you price as a concierge service? Do you price everything in a single package? Do you price specific products? Do you keep track of your time? Um, I, I'll give you a little hint on that. We stopped keeping track of our time. And I'll tell you what, it frees up so much time when you're not tracking it. And there's a whole host of questions. And we'll go over those questions in, um, in the January 30th event, um, because then we can get into the details and how you actually do that. Uh, but there's a lot of questions to drill down to. How do you, if you're not keeping track of time, now how do you price it, right? How do you determine the value? How do you determine um, what, uh, you know, different prices for different clients? Are you, are you gonna have different tiers of pricing, right? Like, we, do we have a tier one, tier two, and tier three, where for tier one, we do, you know, these kind of tax returns. For tier two, we do this, and we do a little, and year in planning. Tier, tier three, we do everything, or something like that. So these are all questions I think that you do have to kind of sit down with um, your partners and your staff and, and, and even, and I would 
suggest even with your clients and say, what do you think? What, what, what should we be doing? Well, right, because you have to get aligned on it because it, be, it becomes a, a cross the firm thing, right? It's not just one piece. When you, when you change your pricing, when you adjust pricing and billing, it affects your capacity, it affects your culture, it affects your team. It really becomes this holistic approach to running a new firm. And it's an exciting new business model, right? Ultimately, that's what you're changing is your business model. And when you say business model, a lot of people get like a little overwhelmed, like, oh my God, it's so much to change, whatever. It's like you do it one step at a time and you can do it one step at a time. You don't have to real, but what happens is as you start to put these pieces together and as you start to change them, you actually see your culture change. And that's the exciting part. And you actually hear your team tell you how much better it is and how they really like it and how they know what their expectations are and they know what to deliver on. And that's what leads to, to retention, which is I think what we all need is we need our team to stay. We, we can't afford to lose our team members because there just aren't enough accountants in the world to, to, to pick up the work that's still out there. It, exactly. And to me, a lot of this is communication, right? I mean, the, the, one of the big buzzwords of the last few years has been transparency. Are we transparent? Well, if we have an upfront pricing, we're transparent with our clients about how much it's going to cost. The thing that kills me, Jody, is I've been in this business 40 years. I've spent time in Ernst and Young's National Tax Department. I've, uh, you know, I, I, I've spent thousands of hours studying the tax law, and yet on an hourly basis, if 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 I were going to bill on an hourly basis, I would always be cheaper than the than the staff person who has to spend 25 hours looking something up. How does that make right. any sense in the world? to either you or your, or your clients. How can that possibly make sense? Really, you're gonna bill by the hour? What about paying your, your staff by the hour? I'll bet most of us, we, we bill by the hour and pay our staff a monthly salary. We're not paying them by the hour. We're paying, we, because we don't wanna pay for inefficiency. But that's exactly how the clients feel if you're billing by the hour. They are feeling like they're paying for inefficiency. And if you and if you express it in terms of hours of going, wow, that's a big hourly rate. You know, I mean, if you were to turn my what what I am into an hourly rate, it's it's somewhere in the five to ten thousand dollar range is my hourly rate. If you turn it into an hourly rate, well, a client's going to go, oh, I don't want to pay five or ten thousand dollars. They want the tax savings. They don't want to pay five or ten thousand. They want the results. Everybody wants the results. They want the results, so they're happy to pay for the results. I Right. Everybody, yeah. Everyone wants to buy the baby. They don't pay for labor, right? <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Why would you? Why would you ever? I'm going to ask this again. Why would you ever bill by the hour? And I'm going to challenge you on that. Why would you ever bill by the hour? You might determine the pricing of it based on hours and and inputs and all that kind of stuff. I get that you're gonna have some kind of formula, but why would you ever bill by the hour? Because that literally makes no sense to anybody. I'm challenging you. I don't think it makes sense to you. I don't think it makes sense to you. You would not want to, uh, uh, what's the biggest complaint about a lawyer? Let's, let's think about this one. Biggest complaint about a lawyer. Every time I pick up the phone, he bills me. Every time I, I get, send an email, she bills me. That's the number one complaint about lawyers. And, and then, the and problem. then what happens, Tom, is people don't call you. So then they have some sort of opportunity where they actually could make a tax impact because it's happening in August and you could structure it. And instead of picking up the phone to call you, they don't call you. And then you see that return in February and you tell your client, I'm sorry, you should have talked to me in, you know, in October when the transaction was happening and there's nothing I can do. And and at the end of the day, you're the one who looks like the jerk, but yet they never called. So that's not like really customer friendly and yet they didn't call. So again, by doing this, it changes that dynamic with the relationship so that people aren't afraid to call. Because then too, before that transaction happens, if you have that conversation, you can tell your taxpayer, hey, I'm absolutely happy to help you with this. It's outside the scope of what we traditionally do. 
but this is what it's going to take to get that transaction across the finish line and it's going to save you x in tax savings yeah exactly i mean a, a, a simple example of that a few years ago um we we build out we price the tax return we said here's what it's going to cost as we're doing the tax return we realize that they had a major construction project that we unfortunately weren't aware of and so we know that if we spend some time in the looking at that construction project under the repair the, at that time they were fairly new for repair regulations we could probably save them 30 to 40 thousand dollars in tax it probably cost them about four thousand dollars in tax return fees now this is a client i'm going to tell you very fee sensitive very fee sensitive client i called them up and i said so we have an opportunity here and i need your buy-in um and see what you think so i think if, i think it's going to take us about four thousand dollars worth of time so about 20 hours to do this um because we're having staff do it about 200 dollars an hour i said it's, it's going to take it's going to cost about four thousand dollars i think we can save about thirty thousand dollars would you like us to do it and he said yeah for sure absolutely do it now this is a very fee sensitive client so so when we finish it of course i've underestimated the savings on purpose and we saved them fifty thousand dollars and it's still four thousand dollars but we saved them fifty thousand dollars and they're like oh my heavens this is the best thing since sliced bread i guarantee you jody had we done that bill at the end and not told them about it they'd have complained about the bill 100 percent and were you kicking yourself that when you understood their value that you didn't charge enough or how did you feel about that? No, I, I'm, I'm good with my pricing. I'm, I'm comfortable with what our pricing is. I'm, I'm comfortable with what it is. Um, we, uh, we, 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 I make more than, I, I make more working less than 500 hours a year than big four partners make. So I'm not too concerned about that because there are different philosophies around that right and i think we'll get into that too there's pricing based on the service right, right. there's also pricing based on the customer right so there, understanding there, who your customer is. is and how you're going to charge and, them and, and the more you get into pricing the real life the more you realize what an art and a science it is for sure and we'll get into that um we'll get into that at um on january 30th we'll get into those kinds of details we're really this going to be a boot camp where we're really gonna get into those kinds of details, those kinds of questions. Um, and so, you know, please join us. Um, I, I, there's, there's a minimum charge, just make sure you get there, um, but please, oh, here we go. Here it is. <laughs> it's a virtual masterclass, uh, 8 a.m. to 2.30 Pacific. So that's uh, 10 a.m. to 4.30 um, Eastern time. Uh, I'm sorry, that's 11 a.m. to 5.30 Eastern time. And uh, it's going to be ninety-seven dollars and six CP credits. So um, you you can go ahead. We'll we'll give you the link in in uh, in a bit here. But right now, um, go ahead and take that back off, and we're going to go to some questions here, Manny. So um, if if you would, we got uh, I th Jody. I think we've got uh, four um, so far. We got some already in the um, in the Q and A. And then if you have uh, live, I have one hand raised. Please, uh, well, let's start. I, I always, by the way, just so y'all know this about me, I always do um, live questions first. <laughs> That's number one rule because I like to have that conversation. It's an easier conversation. So let's go ahead and take that live question. Who's that, that from? Sure, the first question is from Justin. Justin, please unmute yourself. There we go. Go ahead, Justin. Hey, Tom, good morning to you. Good morning. Uh, my question was just that if we're going to take the time to make a time budget, but then not require our staff to track their time, how do we know if we're pricing effectively where profit mar margin or profitability would be with things along those lines? Go ahead, Jody. I, I actually have my thoughts, but it, so, 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 so my thought is, is that um your staff probably aren't telling the truth about time anyway so whatever you think your budget <laughs> is is not correct so um take that with a grain of salt um <laughs> but i think what happens is is it allows your team to spend it gives them an estimate 
Um, I don't think you're ever going to get 100% accurate on what time it takes because is if a person spends an hour on the phone talking to the client, does that have the same value as the person who spends an hour struggling through um, some sort of calculation, right? Because you can't necessarily give those the same weight when you look at time, and a lot of times people do. And so I think as long as um, someone's not taking eight hours when it should be taking two, and I'll say if you manage your people and you manage work, you should be know, you should know if it's taking them longer time or not, and that it's typically a training issue or it's an expectation issue and that they didn't understand the instructions. So again, it's about really managing people and not managing time. And I think that's where as CPAs, we've always been taught to manage the time instead of in every other business who doesn't track time, manage the work and manage the people. And if you manage the people and the manage your work, you'll know what it really takes to get something done um, and why it takes that long. And so I, I would say we just have to, in the old days, it was like walk around more, right? But um, it's just really connecting with your team if they're in a virtual environment to really understand what it takes to get the work done and who they're talking to and why. Yeah, I'm, I'm gonna add a piece to this, Justin, because um, we, this year, um, 2022, this past year, was the first year we didn't record our time. And then the question is, okay, so how do you know that, I mean, how do you actually, like you say, budget for how much time it's going to take? So what we did was at the beginning of the week, we met with all the staff and we said, what, what are you going to get done this week? And we said, are you willing to commit to getting those projects done? So that puts the time budget on them. Because we need to say, okay, the, do we think that's a reasonable budget? That's what the managers do. They need to see if that's a reasonable budget. But, but the staff needs to commit. And we held their feet to the fire. Okay, so the first couple of weeks we get, you know, it's a transition. Um, we had a, a staff member who struggled a little bit. And uh, so I, I would go back to him and say, are you sure? Are you sure you can get that done? Because I want you to succeed. I don't want you to fail. It seems like that's a lot of work. I'm a little concerned. Are you going to really going to be able to do that? Because the reality is, you know, we might say, well, we're going to work 50 hours a week or 60 hours a week or whatever the hours are a week. I don't care. I honestly don't care how many hours you work. I care how much production you get done. All right. So we have to look at it from our standpoint, too, that we're more concerned about production than we are about hours. And that is a big uh, context shift that we have to make first as the partners and, and managers, we have to shift our whole context away from inputs and to outputs. And it's gonna take some time. You know, like Jody said, it's baby steps, right? So I would, I would start, send out an engagement letter, um, tell them that you're gonna give them a price um, before you start working on the tax return. That's a good step, step one for pricing. Get a, get a retainer, even if it's only $1,000, get a retainer from every client. Just get them thinking that, okay, they're trying to improve their business practices. Maybe they can help me improve my business practices too. So that's what clients want to see, that we're good business practitioners. They want to, you know, because they're, they're going, it's about time, right? How many, how many, how many times have you heard that, Jody, where somebody, you know, we, some, one, a firm changed its business practices and the clients go, well, it's about time you change your business practice. We've been wondering when you were going to do that. Yeah, I think customers are more like they they love it more than you'll you'll know until you get through that transition. Because once you get through the transition, like you'll realize how many of your clients are so happy with the new way of working together. Yeah, and, and let me give you a, just a, a little comment on the on the retainers. Um, what you also find is so when when we were submitting the invoice at the end, even though we told them up front, it's still a big number. But by a, with a retainer, you basically cut that number in half. So paying half of it twice is better psychologically than paying it all of it once, right? It's like, how many times do you find, you know, you know if, if you look at, um, <laughs> you know, you're, you're watching TV, you're watching late night TV and they've got this offer and they go four easy payments. 
I guarantee you a lot of people are taking those four easy payments. Well, that four easy payments is a lot more than that one single payment, but they want the smaller number. And that's what we're doing. We're saying two easy payments, one up front, one when, you, when we give you the tax return. So I would absolutely start there um, and, and let's start with that. So I wanna go to Lori here. First question is, um, will the January 30th be me meeting be uh, recorded? Absolutely. Will you be able to watch afterwards? Absolutely. So you want to, um, if you're if you're not able to attend that day, um, then definitely you want to watch. But I think you're going to watch want to watch it multiple times. And I, I think you may even want to watch um, have your staff watch it, um, you know, at least your managers, because you're talking about pricing. I I'm a big believer, Jody, in transparency with my staff. Uh, we're transparent on salaries. Now, that doesn't mean we're sharing individual salaries, but we are sharing where the salary range is for every position, okay? I want to be transparent on salaries. I want to tr be transparent on uh, how many clients are we taking on? How busy are we going to be? Um, you know, what are we doing with the clients? Well, and your team Everything. is doing the work, so they need to understand how it's priced and why it's priced that way, right? Because it helps them understand what's in scope, what's out of scope. Because otherwise, your, your team will give away the house without realizing it. Because if they don't understand the scope of the project, they'll give away the house without realizing it. Not because they want to, but because they just want to do a good job because they love their clients. And they don't realize that the customer didn't necessarily pay for that or it's beyond the scope of the project. So, Right. So, so the, um, Manny, do we have other hands raised? So far, we don't. We still have a couple more questions in the chat. So, so let's take a couple of these questions in the chat, but if you have a question, please please raise your hand, please uh, please put it in the chat. So uh, uh, the, the, discuss, the questions in the, in the Q and A are really about how do, you, how do you determine your price, okay? And I wanna start with a little context on that, um, if I could, uh, Jody, and that sure. is, are you, would you be willing to pay that price to somebody else? So the question to me is, what's valuable to you? Because if it's not valuable to you, it's certainly not going to be valuable to your clients. And I'm, I'm going to—I'll share a story. So I'm in. Uh, so I travel a lot, as you know, Jody, um, around the world. And I—I I noticed that I was traveling that there was one particular brand of luggage, Ramoa. I'm happy to promote them. They're terrific luggage, and that was carried by a lot of flight attendants. I'm going, wow, that's a, that's a really popular brand. I, I went and looked at it, I'm going, so that little bag that they're carrying is like $900. And I'm going, wow, I can get it for $75 at Costco, a little bag like that. And I'm going, okay, I'm gonna bite though, because I want really good luggage. I want luggage that's not gonna fall apart. I want, I want it light, all, all these things that I want. And uh, you know, forever warranted, right? So I want all those things. So I bought, I bought my first Romo bag. I, then I bought the second one, the third one, the fourth one, the fifth one, and I have most of their stuff. Um, but I value, I, I really value the quality of that bag. So my wife and I are in the Ramoa store um, looking at what do they have new, uh, just a little, uh, no, a couple of years ago. And this couple, about our same age, they're in the store and they're and and the husband and wife are talking to each other and they're talking to the salesperson and I hear him going and the husband goes you know we're we're, we're getting this for our daughter it's her graduation present present wow it's expensive and I said I said hmm I said so what kind of car do you drive he says well I drive a Mercedes I said well that's interesting I said you know I gotta tell you I love this luggage I said uh, so what what do you do uh, what, what, what's your business? And because they was, he was so concerned about the price. I said, what's your business? He says, oh, I'm a CPA. And I just, I literally, it was everything I could do to stop laughing right then and there. And I'm going, oh, that tells me everything because you know, Jody, CPA stands for cheapest people in America, <laughs> right? So <laughs> that's a challenge. But look, if we don't value our services, this is my point. This is the context shift that I think we have to get to. If we don't value it, our clients will never value it. So, you know, one of the questions that, that came in was, okay, do I, do I price it per K1, $100 per K1? Well, you have to look at what, you know, I would look at personally, I'd look at what have you been pricing it at? Do you think those prices are the prices you want? 
do you want to increase those prices? What do you, you know, you might, you can do some checking. You, you know, go to Canopy, you can go to some of these other people and say, okay, what, you know, you can look at the, the surveys and so forth. So to get an idea of what pricing is, but the reality is pricing is about the price of, a, uh, of something is willing buyer, willing seller. And that is the fair market value of any service or product, willing buyer, willing seller. So how are, so to me, it's gonna go back to brand, which is what's my brand? Am I a high-end brand? Am I a medium brand or am I a cheap brand? Because you can be a cheap brand. I mean, that's H&R H &R Block has gone to pricing. Uh, you know, they're all about price. They're not at about, about quality. They're not about, you know, it's. <laughs> it, yeah, it's, but how many how many tax preparers have you talked to who actually charge less than H&R Block? That's what kills me. Hmm. That CPAs who are charging less than H&R Block. That is scary. <laughs> That is it, scary. It, it, it's scary, but I, I think you're right. It comes to branding. I think it comes to um, how you decide if you want to price your service, if you want to price your customer. I mean, there's different ways to go about it, but I, I think, again, it's kind of this holistic approach. You have to look at the bigger picture. Uh, how much do you have to price to meet your expenses, right? Like, who are you hiring? Are you hiring um, non-degreed professionals exactly. who have no experience or are you hiring someone with a master's in tax? Because if you're hiring someone with a master's in tax, you're going to have to pay more because you can't afford to pay the team to do the work. So like yeah. you, you have to think about too what your inputs are, what your costs are. There's a lot that go into pricing. Um, and the other interesting thing about pricing, which um, I learned from Ron Baker is like people will pay 20% more for if they're priced up front. For, it doesn't matter what the product is, what the service is, but if they they know the price up front, they'll pay 20% more, which is crazy when you think about it. It's the exact same thing, but it's the psychology. Psychology. It's psychology of the buyer. It, it, it is. So um, uh, again, I still think it starts with psychology of the seller um, because we can't sell something we would never buy. All right, we can't sell something in there, right? Perfect example. When I first started my 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 CPA firm um, in 1995, so the first year I was on my own, the second year was on my own. By the third year, I was overwhelmed, and I actually brought in a friend of mine, and he became my business partner. So we're sitting down to talk about how we're going to price, and of course, we're just hourly rates back then. And he goes, "Well, I think our rate, you know, I think the rate." the right rate, this is, again, this is 30, 30 some odd years ago, should be $130 an hour. I said, okay. I said, my rate's going to be $300 an hour. And he goes, well, you can't bill $300 an hour. I said, I can. I said, I'm not sure you can, but I can. And so we're going to, we're going to value, you know, what percent, what percents we get based on, I'm going to bill $300 an hour. You can bill $130 an hour. I don't care. I said, I'll tell you what, here's what we'll do. We'll, we'll be even at $130 an hour. We'll split those profits evenly. And everything that I can get over $130 an hour comes straight to me. He goes, okay. And he was very upset when I get a check, when we get a check for $50,000, which was over and above the $130 $30 an hour. And I said, so this is mine, you know, that was our agreement. He said, oh, no, 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 that's, I'm going, no. So we, we, we really have to start, Jody, I think, with what's, you know, who are we? You know, this comes back to personal brand. It comes back to the, the brand of our company. You know, I didn't, I haven't always charged the equivalent of five or $10,000 an hour. I, I, I used to, I, I mean, there were some, so there was some work I was charging $130 an hour for because that was the value of it. Okay. It was bookkeeping type work. It was that kind of work. So how do you raise that? Well, you, you have to raise that and we'll do a whole separate webinar on branding. Um, but you really have to start by thinking, okay, who are my clients? Who are my, who are the clients I want? And how do I present that value? Because it, I get back, Jody, to communication. You are setting the expectation with your clients. Now it's always easier, Jody, I'm gonna throw this out. It's always easier to start with new clients. Rather than yeah, 100%. Because a new client, I, I'll give you an example. So years and years ago, we decided to do a, an upfront um, uh, service called a tax strategy. And I remember, 
oh my heavens. So we already had a bunch, we already had a, a, a full list of clients, but for the new clients, we said, well, we're gonna charge you $2,500. Now we charge a lot more than that now, but we are gonna charge you $2,500 for this service. Okay, and we're gonna have basically a couple of conversations and we're gonna come up with a strategy for you to reduce your taxes. We present it to new clients, no problem. Oh yeah, absolutely, I'll do that. I went to an old client and I said, and he said, well, I'm not so sure. I'm not so sure I want to do that. I said, I'll tell you what, if we can save you the money, will you pay the fee? And he said, absolutely. So I made a completely contingent fee. I said, I will do it for free if you feel like it has no value. Well, went in and discovered like $50,000 of tax savings. And his response to me was, you should have done that for me before. I'm not going to pay that fee. We, we actually stopped being friends. We stopped everything because it's, it is much more difficult. Okay. So you do have to be, your communication has to be more clear. It has to be, what do they get out of it? I still think Jody, it's about, it's about the clients. You put the clients first, say, what do the clients get out of this? We're going to split your payments in two. You won't have a big fee at the end. You won't have the, or let's say we're going to, let's say we're even going to price and do a monthly fee. Well, you won't have to pay us a big fee when you get your tax return. That's a benefit to the client, but we have to communicate those benefits to the client. Well, right. You have to be able to express the value because you're doing something different, right? So whenever you're positioning anything, you have to be able to express the value. And I think too, that's a lot of what CPAs get concerned about is like, okay, I want to raise my price. This is what I'm going to raise it to, but then now what do I do, right? Like, how do you express that value? We didn't necessarily learn how to go through sales conversations. That wasn't part of CPA, you know, passing the CPA exam was never having a sales conversation, right? And so you have to relearn those skills of expressing value and doing all those things. And, and what you'll find is, is it just becomes a muscle like anything else. Once you start doing it and you kind of know the, 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 the framework of it, you could do it for anyone and for any service. But if you've never had that teaching or you've never had that exposure, of course, it's intimidating. So it, it, it just becomes a muscle that has to be trained to help you learn how to price and then to really position it. And again, like you said, to feel comfortable in yourself and what you're selling to know that you're worth that value and never ask another CPA what a tax return is worth. Never. Because CPAs, they have the same CPA brain you do. So yep. don't ask them, ask someone who's on the outside, ask a marketer, ask um, someone who works in corporate, ask them, ask a small business owner um, what they yeah. would want to pay. And you know what? You probably got a handful of clients you could ask them. You know, the, there, there's always that handful of clients that you go, I can pretty much talk to that client about anything because they're pretty, you know, we're friends, we, we're, we're devoted to each other, I trust them, they trust me, and ask them, so what do you think of our pricing structure? That is a bold move, you know, and we're, 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 we tend to be shy about talking to our clients, but in every other industry, right? every other industry goes to their clients to find out what their clients want. Okay, I've been listening, for example, this last several months, I've been listening to my clients. And what I keep hearing is they're afraid of IRS audits. With this new IRS funding, they're scared to death of IRS audits. And they've been asking me, well, you talk in Tax Free Wealth, so in that book, I talk about an audit assurance plan where you actually pay an upfront fee as a client. And then when the audit, if the audit does come, you, uh, the CPA handles your tax return for no additional charge. Well, so we tried that. We tried that years ago, but we made it optional. And the problem with making it optional is once you make it optional, then it's, you're going to get some clients say yes, some, uh, some, uh, some clients say no. Well, now, how have you priced it right? Right? Have you priced it right? If you go to, if you think about your life insurance, that's priced right up front. And, and it, what, whatever that mortality table is, that's what they're going to use. And that's the pricing. And guess what? They, you don't get an option. Uh, you know, you can take, do I want this rider or that rider? But guess what? This is the life insurance cost because this is what it's going to cost. And that's a, 
100% of their clients. So if you're going to do something, so we're looking at audit, the, this audit assurance and we're going, well, if we're going to, uh, if we're going to offer that to anybody, we have to make it mandatory for everybody. Okay, you really do. Because otherwise, what you're saying is, is that, well, and, and we got burned, okay? Well, let's say, you, okay, so let's say you have 100 clients, most of you have more, but let's say I had 100 clients, and three take that program and you charge them $500, okay? So one of those three gets audited. Well, that's a 20 to $30,000 fee that you've just given up for $500, all right? Actually for 1,500, right? You get it up for $1,500. But if you had that $500 times 100 clients, right? Now you've got $50,000, okay? And if you think it's gonna be 1%, so then $50,000, you've actually made money on it, okay? Now you don't have to, you can send money back or whatever, um, but you literally, you really have to be careful on the pricing standpoint of, First of all, listen to what your client clients want. We had a lot of clients ask, so we said, we're just going to do it. And so we put that into our fee structure this year. We put it into our engagement letter. We're going to we're, we're, we're do it for everybody, every tax return. And here's what the fee is for the tax return. And it's way cheaper to offer it, to have everybody in it than to have just a few people. You really can't afford to do it for just a few people. And I think too, you also have to think about process, right? So when you're thinking about what your firm actually does and the work it produces and the processes that are involved, because you can't have, most firms today have way too many different one-offs. Everything is its own yeah. unique snowflake. And again, when you talk tax, depending on if you're strictly tax or there's all this accounting and data that has to get to it before you even begin your tax work, all of that accounting and data has to be systematized and the process has to be the same because if you have too many one-offs there's no way you can standardize and get to reasonable pricing with because there's just too much uniqueness right you have to standardize before you automate anything you have to standardize it first right. and so as you go towards more automation and more automation is going to help you to re, um, reduce time and, uh, all those things you have to think about um, what you're selling how you're like what you're you're actually selling and not everyone is going to get everything they absolutely want your firm may have to say no to some clients and that's okay it's not the end of the world to say no to a client yeah and, and that's it that's a really good point um jody it's okay if if a client um it's okay if a client says if somebody comes to you and you say here's how we do it and they say uh well i'd like you to do it this way i i <laughs> they, uh, an interesting one I had this uh, couple and they were um, both doctors, both physicians. Um, and I said, so here's our fee for doing your tax planning. And I, we, we priced it right up front. Here's our fee. And it was, I think for them, it was like $15,000. And she turns to me, she goes, I'll give you seven. I said, great. I said, um, it's 15. You probably can get it for seven from somebody else. I said, so, that's fine. Oh, no, no, I'll give you seven. I want you to do it. I'll give you seven. And I said, great, our price is $15,000. So you're, you're welcome to go somewhere else. This obviously isn't a good fit. That's fine. When you get, Jody, and you, this is such a good point you bring up. When you get to the point where you're okay saying no to new business, or saying no to an existing client. Well, I'll tell you what, the uh, may need to be a book that we write together, Jody, The Power of No. Yeah. Right? Because we just say yes to too much. We absolutely say yes to too much. And um, we need to say no. We just need to say no. Warren Buffett, I think, uh, you know, he said something, I, I'm not quoting him exactly. Um, but, um, you know, it's to the effect that, you know, he became a millionaire saying yes, and he's become a billionaire saying no. And that, that is a big difference. So we do have to be able to say no, but part of that is, are we comfortable with who we are? Do we know who our market is? Do we have the systems in place to market? Um, we we're right now, our network, we add, um, a hundred new clients every month to our network members. So we're not afraid of 
saying no to something. Um, yes, we want to take care of our clients. But if, if we're clear on what we want and we're clear and we deliver that pricing up front, it's okay if they say no. So and, thank you for bringing that up, Jody. And this is too where your team can keep you accountable. Right? And my team would say, why, why are we doing this work? And then it would go off. It, it like they, you know, they know. So then it would go off the rails and then they'd be like, again, why did you say yes to this work? And again, I think that's important to think about because your team watches it as well. So they, they kind of hold you accountable and then you do that once or twice. And all of a sudden you get even more comfortable saying no, because you don't want, you want them, you, you want their respect and you know that they're holding you accountable as well. And that's why I think it's important that you get your whole team involved in it, that pricing and, and all of this is not just for the partner. You really have to have the people who are doing the work involved in it as well. For sure. And, and I want to, I want to just turn one more context on its upside down here, uh, point of context. And that is, it's not about you. This is all about the clients. And here's what happens when you make it about clients. Um, pricing, as you said, Jody, is about the clients. Billing is about the CPA, right? Pricing is about the clients. Billing is about the accountant. Um, but everything should be about the client. So, um, when do they pay their bill? That should be about the client. You know, what's easiest for them? Well, we give them an option. They can pay it all up front or they can pay it monthly. We have, we have some that come October, they'll just pay the rest of the year. I, I'm, I'm fine with that, okay? Here's my minimum expectation is monthly, right? So I charge this monthly. So everything we do, it's just added in, it's, it's, it's charged monthly. I, I made the decision, it's all inclusive. But that is, but we're a relationship business. We're not a transaction business. So you know, you can price transactions or you can price the relationship. That's another thing that I think is important to be thinking about is, do I want the relationship or do I want the project? And if it's a project-based fee, then you're going to be a project-based accounting firm. If it's a relationship-based fee, you're going to be a relationship-based accounting firm. But I do believe it's got to be with the client's interests first and that doesn't mean making it cheapest but it does mean that for example if when i charge for my services and i i do charge way too much i charge more than anybody should rightfully be able to charge um, for my personal um, accounting my personal tax uh, planning services but i won't take on a client that i don't believe i'm if i if i don't believe i'm going to be the best investment they ever make ever ever i will turn them down I have people come to me all the time and I say, yeah, I can't do enough for you to make it worth my fee. So I'm comfortable what my fee is. And I'm also comfortable that I'm not the right person for everybody. And if I can't deliver the value, I'm certainly not going to charge the fee. Tom, good question. We have one here since we're talking about auditing, uh, audit assurance. Um, how do you guys determine the fee or how do you suggest the fee is determining, determined and if it's recurring or monthly? Well, so so it's 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 really an annual fee, right? The question is, am I going to bill it monthly or annually? Right? That's the question. I mean, all our fees are based on what I'm, you know, what's what's the value of that service, right? So you have to determine. Um, if you were to hand, you know, uh, here's, I'll tell you the analysis I went through real quick. I'm going, all right, if they add, uh, I think they'll probably add about 50,000 new auditors. Okay. Uh, in the end, I think that's really what that's going to end up with. It's 50 or 60,000 at the most. If they add that many new auditors, which pretty much doubles their audit staff, and they go after primarily higher end clients, which are all of our clients. Okay. So what's the percentage of audits are we expecting? And what would I charge to handle that audit? What do I think that audit fee should be? Okay. Well, then that's easy. I think, okay. And how many clients do I have? So I'm going to take, we literally did it this way, Jody. We took, okay. How many audits based on the number of clients we have? What percentage? Okay. So if, if I have, if I, if I'm saying, well, I think 1% is going to be audited, 2%, 3%, whatever that is, I multiply it by the number of tax returns. 
right? Then that's the, that's the fee I need to charge and then multiply it by the fee. That's, it's that simple. It's not pricing. I, I think Jody, people think pricing has to be difficult. And I don't think pricing has to be difficult at all. No, I don't, I don't think it is. I mean, you're just measuring your risk, right? Like what's the risk that one of your clients is going to get audited and how much money do you need to cover exactly. that audit? Exactly. So, yeah. Um, so, so um, the man, reason like TurboTax and whatever do it for so cheap is because the risk is so, right. you know, it, it's, it's so spread out, right? Like they have thousands and thousands and thousands of people paying for that audit insurance, right? So it's just like any other insurance company, the more insurance, like um, the more people you have to buy insurance, you decrease the risk of it happening to any one particular person. So if you're a really small firm, you know, what's the chances that they're going to get audited, but then what's the chance that that one person who's going to get audited comes to you too, right? So it's just a, a, a risk analysis. Yeah, exactly. And we'll get into more of these details on January 30th. That's Monday, January 30th. And uh, uh, we just put in the link again. It's wealthability.com slash CPA dash event. Um, here it is. This is the, um, this is all part of our series. So we're going to do, this one's on, on billing and staffing as it relates to billing. Uh, we're gonna talk about things like how do you manage, if you're gonna bill um, on a flat fee basis, now do you record your time? How do you keep track of that? The, the question that Justin had, how do you do that? We're gonna go through that um, on January 30th. So please uh, join us. It is six uh, continuing education credits for that. That one, this one is not, but that one has six continuing education credits. It's uh, $97. You will be able to see the recording afterwards. So we just want to make it really inexpensive, um, really easy, really accessible. It's virtual, so you can do it. And uh, we, we put it hopefully at a time of day that, that most of you will be able to join us. It's absolutely, thank you, uh, Manny. Um, you um, turn that off. We'll go back to so that you can see in the chat. Uh, you'll be able to see what the, um, sorry, what the link is there. And um, Jody, uh, just any final words about pricing? Um, no, I'm just excited about it, right? Like I'm excited that there's such an opportunity and so many practitioners are excited to learn about it, that really the market is changing and that people understand that the market's changing and that we have to up our game and we have to kind of rethink things. And it's exciting to, to see all these practitioners who want to learn how to price their services differently and run their firms more efficiently and, and have a really good tax season. Yeah, I, I love that too. It's, uh, you know, it's been a race to the bottom in our profession for many, many years. It's uh, uh, when you compete on price, I'll tell you what, that is a bad place to be. And we have been competing on price for so many years. Um, as long as I've been in the profession, it's been a competition of price outside of the big four. Everybody else, it's a price competition. Big four said a long time ago, you're going, how are they the biggest firms in the world and charge the most? It's not how are they, but those two are related to each other. They're the biggest in the in, in the they're the biggest in the in the world in part because they charge the most, and not because they charge the most, but they produce the most value. So we had a question, for example, about AI. Will AI change the profession? Absolutely. It, there are tools coming out which allow us. And, and, and Jody, and I, I think Jody, we should do a whole um, session on technology for sure. Uh, that I know you're, you and I both share a lot of commonality on what's coming from technology, but technology is going to allow us to do things with our clients we can never do before. I think technology eventually will do most of the tax return for us, and we will not have to do all that work on the tax return, and we can start spending our time doing things that are valuable to our clients, like consulting. We'll have tools like AI that will allow us to help to analyze uh, not just taxes, but also financials and help us do a better, better job of analysis. That's what this is about. This is about, let's focus on who we are. Let's focus on pricing. Let's give our clients a choice. Um, Manny, is there one, do I see a hand that's, that's, that's up? Do we have one last question? Yeah, we have one from Justin. All right, Justin, you got the first one. You're going to get the last one. Unmute yourself, Justin. 
Uh, maybe he stepped away. All right, then. All right, with that, then, Jody, thank you so much. Um, and uh, glad to see your internet back with us. Yes. That's awesome. Um, you know, in, again, technology is challenging, but really appreciate you all staying with us uh, for a full hour and a half. I mean, what a, what a huge response. We really, we, we love you guys. We love the profession. We, we think that this is, our profession is in trouble and at the same time at a, at a turning point where we have opportunities to do more for our clients, do it um, for better value, um, be able to have more profit, have uh, better, uh, better uh, results with our staffing, and at the same time, have our clients be happier than they've ever been before. So uh, thank you, Jody. Thanks, Manny. Thanks, everybody at WealthAbility. Thank you all, and uh, really appreciate uh, spending time with us, and we will see you. Remember, um, go to wealthability.com slash CPA event, register for our um, course on January 30th. We will do deep dive and we'll talk a little bit more about staffing. I'd, I'd like to get into, we've talked a lot about pricing. Um, it is kind of the topic on Jan, you know, January 5th. That's gonna be the big topic. January 30th, we're gonna be worried about staffing because we're gonna have staffing for the next two and a half months. And after that, we're gonna go, okay, where do we go from here? Um, we just saw uh, an article in the Wall Street Journal. Um, everybody saw it, I'm sure, about how many people are leaving the profession and how few are coming in. So we need to talk about staffing. We need to talk about um, how do you pay your staff? Uh, how do you make life better for your staff? And how do you, most of all, make life better for your clients, which produces a better firm, which in the end, Jody, we're after a better life. So a better thanks. life. Thank you, guys. We'll talk to you soon.